many members of my family were killed by Hitler during the Nazi Holocaust in World War II. My grandparents on my dad's side fled Nazi Germany in the 1930s and found refuge in Palestine, which was the only place they could find refuge because the United States had closed its doors to Jewish asylum seekers during Hitler's ascendancy in the 1930s and throughout World War II and after World War II for that matter as well. We can talk more about that later. My name is Michael Spath and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Before we introduce our speaker for tonight, Josh Rubner and his presentation, we're here to stand in full solidarity with the government of South Africa as it presents its case of genocide against Israel before the International Court of Justice. South Africa's lawyers have argued that the state of Israel has failed to prevent and is continuing to commit acts of genocide against the Palestinian people of Gaza. South Africa's lawyers have also spelled out that the acts of Israel that they've committed against the Palestinian people of Gaza are acts defined as genocidal under Article 2 of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Close to 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, 70% of them women and children, 7,000 unaccounted for, 60,000 injured, 1.9 million, that's 90% of the 2.3 million Gazans displaced, 80% of their homes destroyed. Nothing and no one has been spared, not healthcare workers and hospitals, not school teachers and schools, not churches and religious leaders, not babies. No one has been spared. Here's some of the evidence given in South Africa's 84 page document. Prime Minister Netanyahu quotes from the Bible Spare no one, but kill alike men and women, infants and sucklings, oxen and sheep, camels and asses. Minister of Defense, Gallant, we are fighting human animals and we are acting accordingly. Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. Minister of Agriculture, Dichter, we are now rolling out the Gaza Nakba. Knesset Deputy Speaker, Baturi, now we all have one common goal erasing the Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. And 95-year-old Ezra Yakin, a veteran of the Dari Yassin massacre during the 1948 Nakba, called up for reserve duty, 95 years old, called up for reserve duty as a motivational speaker to boost morale, quote, among the Israeli troops dressed up in fatigues, he says, Quote, finish them off, don't leave anyone behind, erase their memory, erase them, their families, mothers and children. These animals can no longer live. Every Jew with a weapon should go out and kill them. If you have an Arab neighbor, don't wait, go to the home, shoot him. We want to invade, we want to enter and destroy what's in front of us. Destroy houses, then destroy the one after it. With all our forces, complete destruction, enter and destroy. Let's drop bombs on them and erase them. Unquote. All this said out loud, all this out in the open. And there's 10 more pages with similar quotes in the South African case. Various UN officials have described Gaza as, quote, a crisis of humanity, a living hell. A situation of utter deepening and unmatched horror where an entire population is besieged and under attack, denied access to the essentials of survival on a massive scale. And more and more, Israel is talking about how they're, quote, encouraging migration from Gaza into Egypt or other countries, trying to bribe other countries into their ethnic cleansing agenda. And our U.S. government, 
we're actively providing weapons to Israel to drop on Palestinian babies. Our tax dollars, the complicit U.S. government, the criminal Biden administration. I've been saying this for weeks now. This is not about Hamas, and it's not even about Gaza. This is part of a hundred year plus agenda to eliminate Palestinian history, tradition, and culture, to eliminate the Palestinian people, to eliminate from memory the very idea of Palestine itself. It's genocide, it's nothing less than genocide. So we at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace are proud to stand with the Palestinian Palestine Assembly for Liberation, and over a, over a thousand international organizations supporting South Africa. South Africa that knows a thing or two about apartheid and oppression and ethnic cleansing, all characteristics of settler colonial genocide. And we're thankful to Jordan too. Josh Rubner is a leading U.S. Middle East policy analyst and is currently director of government relations at the Institute for Middle East Understanding. He's worked at the Congressional Research Office, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, and American Muslims for Palestine. Presently, Josh is a Ph.D. candidate at University of Exeter's European Center for Palestinian Studies, studying under Dr. Ilan Pape. He's the author of Israel, Democracy or Apartheid State, and Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker Israel-Palestinian Peace. The title of Josh's talk tonight is Palestinian Nakba's From Truman to Biden. Josh, welcome. Thank you very thank you very much, Michael. Thanks to the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace for inviting me here today. Is this good? This needs to be up. Can we all hear in the back? And thank you everyone for coming out on this very cold night to talk about an important subject. Look. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Look. Michael and Sam have laid out to you some of the horrific conditions and circumstances and statistics regarding Israel's relentless assault against the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip that's taken place over the past three months. So rather than reiterate this horror to you in terms of numbers, I think I'll just skip past some of those same statistics that I was going to cite at the beginning of my presentation but also just to stress the relentless bombing campaigns and attacks that we're seeing, not only against Palestinian civilians, but against the Gaza Strip's infrastructure as well. The targeting of hospitals and ambulances, schools and universities, mosques and churches, cultural, historical, and archeological sites throughout the Gaza Strip, are all designed by Israel to make the Gaza Strip unlivable, uninhabitable. And in fact, well before this latest iteration of Israel's violence against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, the UN had already predicted that by 2020, because of Israel's suffocating, illegal siege and collective punishment, against the 2.3 million Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip. Because of this siege and deprivation, that by 2020, the Gaza Strip would become unlivable. So the UN had already predicted that due to Israel's policies, Gaza would be uninhabitable this decade. And Israel has made it even more so in the course of this devastating three-month long attack. Human Rights Watch, one of the leading human rights organizations in the country, said that Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war. 
And in fact, UN agencies have reported that right now, as we speak, 577,000 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are experiencing famine. Already, Palestinians have died due to starvation, due to dehydration, due to the spread of communicable diseases that have spread as a result of people being forcibly displaced from their homes and concentrated in unlivable circumstances. When we see these atrocities being inflicted on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, we have to ask ourselves a question. What is Israel's end game? How does this end? The UN has a special rapporteur for people who are internally displaced persons. This means people who are displaced from their homes but remain within their country. The UN Special Rapporteur for Internally Displaced Persons, Paula Gaviria Betancourt, said that, quote, the only logical conclusion is that Israel's military operation in Gaza aims to deport the majority of the civilian population en masse. And indeed, this is the inescapable logic of Israel's policies toward Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Because if you cannot eat, if you cannot drink, if you cannot have medicine, if you cannot have access to education, of course you are going to be forced en masse from your home, whether at the point of gunpoint or not. And as Michael said at the outset, quoting from South Africa's genocide complaint in the International Court of Justice, Israeli leaders themselves have been explicit about their genocidal intentions toward Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Our Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, says that the South African case against Israel is, quote, meritless. In 84 pages of extremely elegantly written and detailed and exhaustive analysis, South Africa lays out a clear case that far from being meritless, Israel's actions in the Gaza Strip today are a textbook case of genocide. And that phrase, a textbook case of genocide, were the words of an Israeli scholar, Raz Siegel, who specializes in the study of genocide. Indeed, 10 pages of South Africa's complaint, as Michael mentioned, are the very words that Israeli leaders have been proud to say out loud expressing their genocidal commitment and intent. Now, of course, we also have to recognize that, yes, Hamas committed terrible, horrific atrocities on October 7th. However, does the commission of a war crime justify the commission of a war crime in return? Does it justify the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity on a vastly larger scale? Of course it doesn't. And of course the clock did not start on October 7th. If we start the clock on October 7th, it may appear to some that Palestinians are the aggressors and Israelis are defending themselves. And this type of dehistoricized de understanding 
of what's taking place in Palestine, Israel, lies at the root of a lot of problematic thinking in this country about this issue. The clock did not start on October 7th. At the very least, what we need to do is rewind the clock at least to 1948. We need to situate everything that has occurred in Palestine, Israel, within that larger historical context to understand what is happening today. Today, we are witnessing a second Nekba. Nekba is the Arabic word for catastrophe. It's the word that Palestinians use to describe how they were uprooted and dispossessed in the process of the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. More on that later. We are witnessing today a second Nekba that is more devastating, greater in scope in terms of the number of Palestinians who have been killed and in terms of the number of Palestinians who have been forcibly displaced from their homes, greater in scale than in 1948. But to be more accurate, we should not view Israel's actions today in the Gaza Strip as a second Nakba, but more accurately as the latest terrifying, horrific apotheosis of an ongoing 75-year-long Nakba catastrophe against the Palestinian people. And nor should we be surprised by the ferocity that we see in Israel's killing of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip today. As Michael noted, Israeli political leaders have been calling openly for a second Nakba, have been calling openly to finish the job of 1948 to complete the original act of ethnic cleansing. So how do we understand this insatiable Israeli drive to try to eliminate the presence of the Palestinian people from their historic homeland? We can view it through the lens of settler colonialism. And we can learn quite a bit from Patrick Wolf, the scholar of settler colonialism, who wrote in Settler Colonialism and the Elimination of the Native, that what settler colonialism does is to enact the, quote, logic of elimination against the indigenous people. Now, we, of course, know what the logic of eliminating the indigenous people look like from our own history in this country. And Patrick Wolf said the following, quote, whatever settlers may say, and they generally have a lot to say, the primary motivation for elimination is not race or religion, ethnicity, grade of civilization, etc., but access to territory. Territoriality, Patrick Wolf wrote, is settler colonialism's specific irreducible element. The idea of conquering and possessing territory is the beating heart of all settler colonial movements. And Patrick Wolf also told us, taught us, that the process of settler colonialism and its invasion against the indigenous population is a structure, not an event. In other words, it's not one singular act against the indigenous population, but a process that sometimes takes decades and even centuries. And that at different stages of the settler colonial process, 
The colonizing power employs different tactics to accomplish the elimination of the native. Sometimes it's through frontier violence. Sometimes it's through assimilating the indigenous. Sometimes it's through fragmenting their presence on the land. Sometimes it's by concentrating them into ever smaller reservations or Bantu stands from the South African context. And sometimes, yes, it involves ethnic cleansing and even genocide. So we should not at all be surprised at what we're witnessing, because what we're witnessing is an advanced stage of Israel's settler colonial logic of elimination against the Palestinian people. And nor should we be surprised that Hamas's violence on October 7th, an attack which was unprecedented in scope against Israeli civilians in 40 and 75 years, also triggered this unprecedented level of violence that Israel is now employing against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. Why? Why should we be not surprised? Because Hamas's attack on October 7th unleashed the darkest fear of any settler colonial society. And I think back to a eulogy that was given by Israeli Chief of Staff Moshe Dayan, a eulogy which he delivered at Kibbutz Nachal Oz, near the Gaza Strip, in 1956, when Palestinian militants infiltrated from the Gaza Strip and killed a number of Israelis, including one by the name of Roe. And this is what Moshe Dayan had to say at the funeral of Roe in 1956. And I'm going to quote at length because it's worth it. This is what Moshe Dayan said, quote, let us not cast the blame on the murderers today. For eight years, they have been sitting in the refugee camps in Gaza. And before their eyes, we have been transforming the lands and the villages where they and their fathers dwelt into our estates. It's not among the Arabs in Gaza, but in our own midst that we must seek Roe's blood. How did we shut our eyes and refuse to look squarely at our fate and see in all its brutality the destiny of our generation? Have we forgotten that this group of young people dwelling at Nachal Oz is bearing the heavy gates of Gaza on its shoulders? We will make our reckoning with ourselves today. We are a generation that settles the land, and without the steel helmet and the cannon's maw, we will not be able to plant a tree and build a home. Let us not be deterred from seeing the loathing that is inflaming and filling the lives of hundreds of thousands of Arabs who live around us. Let us not avert our eyes, lest our arms weaken. This is the fate of our generation. This is our life's choice to be prepared and armed, strong and determined, lest the sword be stricken from our fists and our lives cut down. A lot of people read Moshe Dayan's words falsely as an expression of empathy with the Palestinian people residing in refugee camps just across the armistice lines from Kibbutz Nachal Oz in the Gaza Strip. But Dayan's eulogy was not a call for compassion or empathy with the Palestinian people, but an honest reckoning with the hatred that was engendered by Israel in stealing Palestinians' lands and dispossessing the Palestinian people of their lands and noting 
that in this settler colonial reality, one always has to keep one's guard up in perpetuity, lest the natives return and undo this settler colonial project. This is what Moshe Dayan was trying to convey in 1956. And this is what Israel tries to convey for the Palestinian people today in 2024 in the Gaza Strip. So speaking historically, what were the components of the Nakba in 1948? And I'll touch on three here tonight. Number one, the violence and terror and massacres that Israel inflicted on the Palestinian people to induce them to flee in fear for their lives. Number two is the systematic destruction and appropriation of their property. And number three is the turning of the Palestinian people into permanent refugees who are not allowed to return home. These are the three major components of the Nakba. And in 1947 and in 1948, when Israel was committing these acts of ethnic cleansing against the Palestinian people, the modus operandi for the Israeli military forces and militias was to surround a Palestinian village on three sides, leaving one side open for the people to flee after Israel usually opened fire and usually massacred several members of that village in order to induce that terror to compel people to flee. Israel forcibly expelled from their homes about 75% of indigenous native Palestinians who lived in what became the state of Israel. Israel demolished between four and 500 Palestinian villages, towns, and cities, and in some cases repopulated those villages, towns, and cities with Israeli Jews. Now, what did we as a country understand about this process of Israel's ethnic cleansing in 1948? We had US diplomats stationed on the ground in Jerusalem, and in Haifa, the city along the Mediterranean Sea. Now, U.S. diplomats were far from omnipresent. They didn't know exactly what was taking place all over the length and breadth of the country. But they knew and they saw enough, and they reported on this process of driving Palestinians from their homes in places like Jerusalem, Haifa, Jaffa, Akka, throughout the Galilee, and along the coast in the south, along the Mediterranean Sea, from the towns of Istud and Askalan. All of this was reported back to the Truman administration in Washington, DC. Here's something that was written by Mark Etheridge, who was President Truman's appointee to what was known as the Palestine Conciliation Commission, which was set up in 1949 to address the outcomes of the Nakba and to try to restore some semblance of peace to Palestine. This is what Mark Etheridge wrote to the Secretary of State, Dean Atchison at the time on February 28, 1949. Quote, my own feeling is that the US has accumulated an enormous moral and even financial responsibility in the situation. These people, Etheridge wrote, referring to the Palestinians, have been displaced either by force or terrorism or have fled because of their own fear. Even if the American public has not been told about the Der Yassin massacre, one of the most infamous massacres of the Nakba, all Arabs know about it, Etheridge wrote. And all Arabs with whom the commission has talked has either implicitly or directly blamed the US and the UN for displacing 700,000 persons. Sound familiar? US diplomats also understood that the systematic 
destruction of Palestinian property that they were witnessing, the systematic appropriation by Israel of whatever Palestinian land it wanted, and the wanton looting of Palestinian property in 1948 was not an act of avarice. It was not an act of greed on Israel's part, but it was designed for a specific purpose of preventing Palestinians from returning to their homes. This is what John McDonald said on July 27, 1948. John McDonald was the U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem at the time. He said there was, quote, no respect or protection for Arab interests and property. Every Arab house and shop has been thoroughly looted. And even window frames, doors, plumbing, electric fixtures and installations were removed. Those few Palestinians who somehow managed to stay in their homes and resist this ethnic cleansing hardly fared any better in McDonald's estimation. McDonald wrote, quote, the few Arabs remaining in this area are constantly searched by military authorities who remove furniture, clothing, and any money in their possession. If authorities in control disapprove of this action, as they allege, they apparently are unable to control the situation. Due to the conditions that he saw, McDonald concluded that, quote, there is little, if any, possibility of Arabs returning to their homes in Israel or Jewish-occupied Palestine. A note on that terminology. When he says Jewish-occupied Palestine, he's referring to areas of Palestine that Israel conquered beyond what the UN had recommended for a Jewish state. The last major component of the Nekva that I want to discuss, and the one that is most relevant to our conversation today, is Palestinian refugees, the appalling circumstances that they lived in in 1948, and Israel's refusal to allow those Palestinian refugees to return home. Again, John McDonald, the U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem in 1948, went to nearby Ramallah in mid-August of 1948. And he found that its normal population of that district of 60,000 now had an additional 100,000 more people. And McDonald found that their condition was, quote, appalling. Most refugees were, quote, destitute, possessing only what they could wear or carry on their backs from their home. And they are entirely dependent on the meager relief assistance available. Like the 1.9 million Palestinians who were internally displaced in the Gaza Strip today, these Palestinians who John McDonald encountered in Ramallah in August of 1948 also lacked adequate access to shelter, to sanitation, to medical care, to food and water. The overstretched Transjordanian government, which was responsible for the West Bank at the time, could only provide each refugee with the equivalent of 250 grams of bread per day, which amounts to about 600 calories. This diet, John McDonald cabled, had been in effect for approximately three weeks and is insufficient to sustain life for long. Again, sound familiar? Now, as harrowing as McDonald's account was of the conditions facing Palestinian refugees in the Ramallah area, after conducting a two-week extensive survey of refugee encampments in Lebanon, in Syria, inside Israel, in the West Bank, and in the Gaza Strip, in mid-November, 1948, a man by the name of R.T. Schaefer, who was the director of the American Red Cross Relief Mission in the Near East, concluded that of all of these refugee encampments he visited, the situation facing Palestinians in the Gaza Strip 
was, quote, the worst. There were 80,000 Palestinians living in the territory that became known as the Gaza Strip in 1948, before the Nakba. And Israel's ethnic cleansing added 200,000 refugees into this tiny strip of land. This is what Schaefer wrote. Quote, in one camp of 10,000, we visited no tent that did not have patience with dysentery. All were suffering hunger. Compounding the suffering that Schaefer saw in Gaza was the fact that the refugee population in the Gaza Strip continued to multiply. And why did the refugee population continue to multiply? It was because Israel was continuing its ethnic cleansing operations, driving more Palestinians into the Gaza Strip. Again, Schaefer, quote, Arab villages are still being burned in the Gaza district. I saw them burning. And refugees are continuing to pour into the pocket from Gaza to Rafah on the Egyptian border. Now, with Egypt having closed the border to Palestinian refugees in 1948, Schaefer wrote, quote, bewildered homeless refugees are congesting the area from Gaza to Khan Yunus to Rafah with despair on their faces as they watch the smoke from their burning villages mounting into the desert sky. Again, sound familiar? I read these reports in the National Archives of what Israel did to the Palestinian people in 1948. And I, like you, look in horror at my social media feed to see what Israel is doing against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip today in 2024. And I cannot help but be reminded of the quote from the Spanish philosopher George Santayana that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We are watching today a repetition of this sad history play out yet again. And let's be clear that this ethnic cleansing in 1948 was meant to create a Jewish majority state, and in fact was the only way that Israel could create a majority Jewish state, by removing the majority of the indigenous Palestinian population. Back to Mark Etheridge, the US representative to the Palestine Conciliation Commission who got his brief from President Truman in January of 1949 and went out to the region in February of 1949 to begin his investigation and negotiations with the government's concern. This is what he wrote in a letter to his wife, the writer Willie Snow Etheridge, dated February 7th, 1949. Etheridge wrote, quote, I am afraid the Jews have learned too much in terrorism from the masters who taught it to them. Germany, Poland, and Russia. We get the most distressing word of systematic destruction of Arab homes. About 600 to 700,000 Arabs are refugees. We are supposed to solve the problem and we are working on it, he wrote his wife. However, he wrote, Israeli Foreign Minister Moshe Shertak, who later changed his name to Sharet, quote, is determined that they, the refugees, shall not come back. In fact, he wants a homogenous state with no minority of Arabs. I could have pointed out to him, but restrained myself, that the way he talked about the Arabs, that he talked about the Arabs in exactly the same way we heard Hitler talk about the Jews, and that his method of dealing with the Arab question was patterned pretty much after Hitler's. Etheridge's attitude toward Israel's dispossession of the Palestinian people hardened even more 
after he visited a Palestinian refugee camp in Jericho. Quote, I've never seen so many horrible things in one day in my life, he wrote. Huge families live in one tent, but great numbers have not even a tent and live in the open. What Etheridge saw that day, February 14th, 1949, could only draw for him equivalencies to what he knew about U.S. history. Etheridge wrote to his wife, Willie, quote, I don't know any better parallel than the way we treated the American Indians. The disheartening thing is that I have not yet heard one Jewish official who seemed to have any sympathy. I have tried to make it plain to them that I have no sympathy with their attitude and that it is one thing they must do something about or answer to the conscience of the world. So what did President Truman do with this knowledge, do with these reports that were streaming back to Washington from his diplomats and from his representatives? Yes, the Truman administration supported the partition recommendation of the UN in November 1947. However, three weeks later, the State Department recognized that dividing Palestine against the wishes of the majority of the indigenous Palestinian people was a violation of their self-determination. And in fact, when President Truman recognized that he could not get agreement on the peaceful implementation of partitioning Palestine, he revoked U.S. support for it in March of 1948 instead supporting a UN trusteeship for Palestine until matters could be settled. Yes, President Truman gave immediate de facto recognition of the State of Israel in May 1948 against the express advice of his experts in the State Department. So he doesn't come out smelling like roses particularly in this saga. But on the other hand, the United States under President Truman helped to draft and pass through the United Nations, not one, not two, not three, but nine separate ceasefire, truce, and armistice resolutions to stop the violence, to stop the ethnic cleansing. And let's also not forget that the Truman administration not only voted for, but helped to write UN General Assembly Resolution 194 in December of 1948, which said that Palestinian refugees should be allowed to return to their homes at the earliest practicable date. The Truman administration called for a limited internationalization of Jerusalem. The Truman administration said that any land of Palestine that Israel conquered beyond the partition boundary recommendations would have to be traded with land that was initially given to the Jewish state. In other words, Israel could not keep its conquests without relinquishing some of its sovereign territory. And the Truman administration also demanded that Israel repatriate at least one third of Palestinians who had been expelled from their homes. But Truman confessed to Mark Etheridge in April of 1949. Truman confessed to Etheridge in April 1949. Quote, I am rather disgusted with the manner in which the Jews are approaching the refugee problem. I told the president of Israel in the presence of his ambassador just exactly what I thought about it. It may have some effect. I hope so. But it had no effect. It had no effect because the Truman administration limited itself, contented itself to making private demands 
of the Israeli government without there being any tangible consequences for Israel defying U.S. policy goals. So what lessons can we draw from how President Truman handled this situation in 1948 when we look at how President Biden is handling this situation today in 2024? Israel defied a UN arms embargo in 1948. It defied ceasefire and truce resolutions, which actually called for sanctions to be imposed by the UN for those who violated the ceasefire. And it defied the US on the internationalization of Jerusalem, on the territory that it conquered, and on not allowing for Palestinian refugees to come home. The only thing that the Truman administration did to put some pressure on Israel was to temporarily suspend allocations of a $100 million export-import bank loan. George McGee was the State Department's coordinator on Palestine refugees. And he wrote to Mark Etheridge, the US representative on the Palestine Conciliation Commission in May of 1949, that the US should be, quote, exerting all pressures at our disposal. But I'm afraid that there has, as yet, been no disposition to utilize any of the bargaining points which we have. In other words, what McGee was saying to Etheridge was that the US held tremendous leverage over Israel, but was refusing to pressure Israel to accomplish US and international goals. So if you take this corp corpus of, by, uh, of Truman administration policy and compare it to the Biden administration's policies of today, as much as we were complicit, as much as we allowed Israel to ethnically cleanse the Palestinian people in 1948, the degree of complicity today is infinitely greater than it was in 1948. President Truman did not send even one single bullet to Israel in 1948. He embargoed arms to Palestine. But instead of embargoing US weapons to Israel, as has been called for by Amnesty International, by Human Rights Watch, the Biden administration has opened up the tap to ensure that weapons to Israel are flowing at an even greater rate than normal. It's expediting the delivery of US weapons to Israel through what's known as a Pentagon Tiger Team. It's allowing unprecedented drawdowns of weapons that are pre-positioned by the United States in Israel under something called the Warsaw I, which stands for the War Reserve Stockpiles Act Israel. It's invoking emergency discretionary powers to completely bypass Congress and prevent them from having any effective oversight whatsoever. And on top of all of this, President Biden has requested that Israel get $14.3 billion of more weapons. Every time a 2,000 pound, 2, pound dumb bomb is dropped on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, that is a Mark 84 munition made by the United States, dropped from an F-16 fighter jet. In the case of a smart bomb, when these dumb bombs have a GPS laser guidance system attached to them, those what are called joint direct attack munitions are manufactured in St. Louis, Missouri by the Boeing Corporation. Every single US weapon that Israel is employing against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip today are paid for by you and me as taxpayers 
and given to Israel as a gift. Israel doesn't buy these weapons from the United States. We pay for them from our taxpayer dollars. And it's our members of Congress, and it's our president who make those decisions. Instead of supporting a ceasefire to save lives like President Truman did, President Biden has shamefully stated that there is, quote, no possibility of a ceasefire. And we've seen how the U.S. has vetoed a ceasefire resolution in the United Nations. The United States has said that Israel should abide by international humanitarian law, that Israel should mitigate harm to civilians. Yet, at the same time, the spokesperson of the National Security Council, John Kirby, repeatedly has stated that there are no red lines, quote, that Israel can conceivably cross in this attack on Gaza. And despite the fact that the Biden administration has said repeatedly that it does not support the forcible displacement of the Palestinian people from the Gaza Strip into the desert of the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, nevertheless, President Biden has requested from Congress up to $3.5 billion, quote, to address potential needs of Gazans fleeing to neighboring countries. If you don't support the forcible displacement of Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, then why are you asking Congress for billions of dollars to fund exactly that? It doesn't make sense. And Israel has repeatedly ignored these statements from the United States that it should abide by international humanitarian law, that it should avoid harming civilians. Why wouldn't they also then go ahead and ignore the United States when the United States says no forcible displacement of Palestinians? And if President Truman was not willing to impose sanctions on Israel for defying US policy, in 1948, does Israel really fear President Biden doing this in 2024? In conclusion, inevitably, there will have to be a negotiated ceasefire. Israel has waged large-scale warfare against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip in 2009, 2012, 2014, and now 2023 to 24. And up until now, every single round of Israeli attacks against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip has ended in a negotiated ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Inevitably, the ceasefire will have to be. The only question is how many more lives must be taken before the ceasefire is put into place. There will be a day after. But the current planning that the U.S. is doing for the day after is very circumscribed. It's very narrow. It's very unimaginative. The Biden administration is talking about who's going to govern Gaza. How is Gaza going to be rebuilt? How will we get negotiations back on track for a two-state resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian issue? <sighs> These are insufficient conversations that need to be had for the day after. Any day after planning must grapple with the fundamental realities that the injustices of 1948 have not been resolved yet. It must grapple with four realities that cannot be ignored if we are to see justice and peace prevail. Number one, since 1967, when Israel began its brutal military rule over the Palestinian West Bank and the Gaza Strip, Israel has ruled over the totality, 100% of historic Palestine. Through what B'Tselem, the Israeli human rights organization, calls, quote, a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. 
a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. This is an Israeli human rights group. So number one, we have to grapple with this apartheid reality of Israel's rule over the Palestinian people. Number two, we also have to grapple with the reality that Israel never has supported and never will support the existence of a truly independent and sovereign Palestinian state in any tiny fragment of historic Palestine. As the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu recently boasted, quote, I'm proud that I prevented the establishment of a Palestinian state. And indeed he did. And indeed all Israeli Prime Ministers preceding him have as well. So number one, we have to recognize the apartheid nature of Israel's rule over the Palestinian people. Number two, recognize the reality that Israel will never allow for a Palestinian state. And number three, recognize that partitioning Palestine into two states against the wishes of the indigenous majority Palestinian people was a historical injustice. And that this historical injustice has been the paradigm. Imagine this. An injustice has been the paradigm for how the entire international community has thought about this issue for the last 75 years. How can an injustice form the foundation for peace? And then number four, we must recognize that Palestinians not only have the right to return to their homes within the Gaza Strip, from which they've been forcibly displaced by Israel in the past three months, but Palestinian refugees in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank and throughout the diaspora of the Palestinian people must have their fundamental right of return to their original home recognized and actualized. The right of return of Palestinian refugees, the right of their return to go back to their homes and go back to their lands is the only way that we can begin to remedy the injustices of the Nakba, the injustices of the ongoing Nakba. From Truman to Biden, the injustices of the ongoing Nakba have gone on for 75 years plus. Dismantling Israel's apartheid regime, recognizing that partitioning Palestine into two states was an injustice then and an impossibility now in enabling Palestinian refugees to finally return home these are the bases for Palestinian freedom, justice, equality, and self-determination. And for ending what the first U.S. ambassador to Israel, James McDonald, termed a tragedy of catastrophic proportions. Thank you. Oh, well, we have some time for questions. Uh, Josh, let me start out and just... I've asked you this in every venue so far. It might be helpful for us to just hear from you, your story, and what brought you to work for Palestinian justice and human rights. Can you share a bit about that with us? And then we'll open it up to the, uh, to the crowd here. Sure. Thank you for that question, Michael. <clears throat> Many members of my family were killed by Hitler during the Nazi Holocaust in World War II. My grandparents on my dad's side fled Nazi Germany in the 1930s and found refuge in Palestine, which was the only place they could find refuge because the United States had closed its doors to Jewish asylum seekers during Hitler's ascendancy in the 1930s and throughout World War II and after World War II for that matter as well. We can talk more about that later. <clears throat> my grandparents' side on my mom's side uh, were caught in Germany during the outbreak of the war. And my grandfather uh, and his properties and businesses were expropriated by the Nazis and he was thrown into a concentration camp. And he bartered his life for his businesses to the Nazis. 
And they too could only find refuge in Palestine after they were uh, escaped from Germany. They got transit to the United States about six months later. So my personal history is very much caught up with the history of Palestine in many, many profound ways. My father was born in Palestine before there was a state of Israel when the British st still ruled the country and he grew up as a child, as a citizen of the state of Israel before coming with his family here to the United States where I was born. So I've always had that very personal familial connection uh, to the issue. And you know, as I became uh, aware of history, as I had my own experiences, uh, as I had my own interactions with Palestinian people and I saw things for myself with my own two eyes, I came to what I would say is a gradual realization of the injustices that Israel inflicted and continues to inflict against the Palestinian people. Now, some people say, how can you, as the grandson of a Holocaust survivor, stand up here and make all these denunciations of the only Jewish state in the world? And I know what my fellow Jewish people often call me, very nice names that I often receive in my inbox and uh, through DMs and so forth. Uh, but look, <clears throat> some Jewish people say never again to mean that Never again should what Hitler did to the Jewish people in Europe be replicated toward the Jewish people, which means that the Jewish people need to be strong and muscular and fight. And this is embodied in the state of Israel today. Other people look at the notion of never again and adopt a more universalistic understanding rather than a tribalistic or nationalistic interpretation. These are people like Raphael Lemkin, who was a refugee from Hitler, Jewish refugee from Hitler, who found refuge in this country. And he was an international lawyer who coined the term genocide. And it was through Lemkin's initiative at the UN and his own personal lobbying that convinced the UN General Assembly to adopt the aforesaid Genocide Convention of December 1948. And this is what I mean by the universalistic interpretation of never again, that when we look at the horror the Nazi Germany inflicted, not only against Jewish people, but against many different communities during World War II, we have to say that that never again should apply to all people, regardless of their race, or whatever race means, ethnicity, nationality, religion, so on and so forth. No human being should be treated that way, that there are fundamental human rights that every human being enjoys because they exist as a human being. <clears throat> this is what the entirety of the post-World War II international order was structured upon. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights passed in December of 1948. The Genocide Convention passed in December of 1948 the Fort Geneva Convention to protect civilians during times of war in 1949, the International Court of Justice. All of these institutions were set up to say never again should there be the type of atrocities committed during World War II. And why is it that we as a country have no problem identifying when Russia invades Ukraine and commits aggression toward it, and occupies its territory, and annexes territory, and commits horrific war crimes against the people of Ukraine. Why are we able so quickly to make a determination that President Putin should be before the International Criminal Court? Yet, the Secretary of State says that this meticulously documented case of genocide that was brought by South Africa is, quote, meritless. It makes a mockery of any professed values that the Biden administration supposedly has as the basis of its foreign policy. <clears throat> 